The passage this morning is from Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. If you have your Bibles or your phone, or if you could look straight in front of you, the passage should be there. And it's in the ESV. It says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you and see you or an absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of the Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engage in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. See, the book of Philippians is the epistle of joy. It's ironic because it's one of the epistles that Paul is writing as a prisoner in chains awaiting trial. The reason Paul is joyful is because Christ is being preached. While he's in prison, he, Christ is still being preached and even inside the prison cells. And Christ is being magnified through Paul. Christ being preached, Christ being magnified was all that Paul was concerned about. It's not about Paul complimenting himself or boasting about himself, thinking about all the other accolades and everything that he has accomplished. That wasn't important to Paul. What was important to Paul was Christ Jesus, that he knows without Jesus he is nothing and would only accomplish things that are meaningless. Because apart from God, everything is meaningless. As it said in verse 5, what Paul was going through was causing the believers to have this deeper, more intimate relationship. And the word fellowship is the Greek word for koinonia, which means participation. Participating in fellowship together, working together. And even now, 2,000, or late, 2000 years later, we see how when a part of the body of Christ is suffering or going through adversity, that there are many who gather around them, supporting them, and there is a deepening of fellowship. We never want to see anyone suffer, yet even through those difficult moments, God uses those moments to bring us closer and have a deeper fellowship. And I want to take this opportunity to let James, Natalie, Jethro, and the rest of the family know that they're not alone. That we are family, that we're there for them. That we love them. To me, in the past year, talking to them, seeing their family go through something that I can't fathom that I will be able to go through. Their faithfulness, their perseverance, their unwavering commitment to God and to each other, to me is a testimony, testament, an example to each of us here. To me, looking there at their life, I've been blessed and I've been challenged. We get these letters from where Natalie writes these letters and I read them and wow, their conviction, their love, not just for the family or Jethro, but their love for God. That's challenging to me. It challenges me, would I be able to go through that? And when we, when, when we found out about Jethro's situation, first thing was we all prayed. And we still pray. But their faithfulness, perseverance, their unwavering commitment is a testament. And hopefully it's a testament for all of us, no matter the adversar adversaries or difficult moments. We can be faithful. We can persevere. We can be committed to him. And what we will see in these four verses is how Paul uses these phrases, words, fig figures of speech to exhort the Philippians to remain steadfast, to remain united, unafraid, and to regard the privilege of suffering for Christ something to rejoice in. 
Paul uses words, phrases, figures of speech to exhort the Philippians to remain steadfast, to remain united, unafraid, and to regard their privilege, to regard their privilege of suffering for Christ, something to rejoice in. And here's a question I'd like to ask this morning. What is the faith of the gospel? When we're reading this, what is the faith of the gospel? We are to notice here in verse 27, it says the faith. Not faith in this gospel, but the faith in the gospel. Or it doesn't just say faith, period. It's the faith. And whenever you see in the scriptures where it says the faith, it's not about individual faith or individual personal trust in God, but it's talking about the body of belief, the teachings of the gospel, and about Christ in the Bible. It's talking about the truth about God. When it's talking about the faith. It's talking about the truth about, about Christ. And Paul writes in Timothy, to young Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, or later times, some would depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. Before Christ comes again, there will be a great falling away, departing from the faith. There will be many who profess to be believers. It's easy to profess with our mouths that we are believers, that we are Christians, that I believe in Jesus Christ. It's so easy to say it with our mouths. But they don't really possess Christ. They don't really have Christ. In actions, there is no Christ in their actions. It's all it's about just talking and it comes out of our mouths. They don't really possess Christ. And when they, when they don't possess Christ, they will turn away from the faith. They will turn from the truth about Christ. Jude, write, Jude says in Jude chapter 1, verse 3, I found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. This means there is no new doctrine. There is no new enlightenment. There is no new revelation. There is no new truth that are going to come along and replace the word of Christ. Harry Allen Ironside said, If it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. People are always looking for some kind of new doctrine, some kind of new truth. But the truth is, there is no new doctrine. There is no new truth. There is only the doctrine of Christ and the truth of Christ. Therefore, Paul in these verses gives us three essentials needed for us to be steadfast and unwavering. First, it is this, to live consistently, to live consistently. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. In verse 27, are we conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel? Every time we go visiting somewhere, church, families, people's houses, we tell our kids, behave. Behave. Especially to our youngest one. Behave. Do not act out. Do not cry it. Do not embarrass us. Parents, raise your hands if you've ever felt your kids embarrassed you in public. Yeah. I, I've been embarrassed. Even at church, I've been embarrassed. Do not embarrass me. Raise your hands, kids, students, if you've if ever embarrassed your parents in public. <laughs> Catherine says... 
<laughs> yeah, we have. All of us have. All right. But why do we tell our kids not to embarrass us? Why? Why do parents feel the need to not want to be embarrassed? Why do the kids have to, have to feel the need to embarrass their parents? Right? We tell them not to embarrass us because they represent us and they represent our parenting. It's not about embarrassing themselves because people look at the kids and they go, who are the parents of these kids? So we're afraid not for our kids. We're afraid because of us. Me, right? Let's go even a little deeper. How many husbands and wives ever felt embarrassed because he or she did something? <laughs> right? Come on, husbands and wives, raise your hands. Right? <laughs> right? You know, a lot of times, you know, I would dress in certain clothing, and then I'd show it to my wife. She'd be like, uh-uh, uh-uh, go change. I'm like, it looks good, so, uh-uh, no. She's not, she's not about me, right? It's about, she doesn't want to look, she doesn't want to be with the person that looks like this, walking with her and knowing that's my husband, right? It is. How many wives, and we have some few wives here, have, all, have ever told your spouses or your husbands to dress a certain way? <laughs> and they have, they're not even married yet, <laughs> right? It is. And that's something that we have to really understand. That it says that we are to walk and conduct ourselves in the manner worthy of the gospel. Right? We call ourselves Christians. We profess ourselves to be Christians. And we have to understand in this Christian life that we are representing Christ. And Christ, God through Paul, is telling us to conduct ourselves in the manner worthy of the gospel. Don't do anything that's going to be shameful to Christ, that doesn't represent Christ. Do not say we are believers, we are Christians, we are followers of Christ, that we are faithful to the word, but yet do something that is so contrary to Christ. It's just to, work, to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. I heard a story of an evangelist who was in a certain town conducting some revival meetings for several nights preaching the gospel and so forth. The time came for him to leave town, so he went to the train station. He was, buying he was buying a ticket to get on the train and to head home. And the person working in the ticket booth purposely, purposely gave more change back than he should have. The evangelist, the minister, looked at his change and realized that he was given more money than he should have. Let's stop there. Who would have kept the change? Oh, yeah, there's 20 more dollars. This train ride is free. God has blessed me. Who would have kept the change? Who would have been honest and said, you know what? I'm going to return everything. <laughs> Lauren says yes, proudly yes, right? The evangelist turns around and he said, I'm sorry but you gave me too much money back here and gave it back to the man in the booth. The man in the booth responded, I know, I know. I've been sitting in your evangelistic meetings all week. I did it on purpose to see if you would keep the money. So we never know who is watching. We are to live consistent, conducting ourselves in the manner worthy of the gospel. 
our behavior should be becoming of the gospel of Christ. Because if this evangelist, this minister kept the money, he would have ruined everything. He would have ruined his testimony. The man in the booth would have went back and said, you know what, I tested him, he failed that test, he kept that money. And all that work would have been for nothing. And he would have brought shame to Christ, to the name of Christ. Instead of the name is being beautiful, the name of Christ, it would no longer be beautiful. Who we are, who we really are, are not when others are watching, or our friends are watching, our peers are watching. Who we really are is when no one is watching. Are we conducting ourselves in the manner worthy of the gospel? Second thing we need to stand firm, we need to work cooperatively. Cooperatively. And it comes in verse 27, it says, So that whether I come and see you or an absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Working together, striving together. We need consistency in our walk, but also cooperation in our walk. And as a church, we need to get along. We need to get along. We need to love each other. We need to pray for each other. Because a few weeks back, I asked for us to pray for one another. Praying for each other by name. Instead of the, as a whole body, I'm saying, I'm praying for the church itself, but to pray for each other by name. We need to get along and we need to love each other as Christ has loved us. As much, as, as much grace we have received from Christ, we, we receive it and we show it to others. I don't know what it is, but it is baffling that Christians just don't seem to want to get along. We should all have the same goals, the same purpose, same plan, same mind, yet our selfishness, me, 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 our pride, our own agenda gets in the way. It really does. We behave as if we are better than the other person. We love to hear our own praises. We boast of our own, of our own ability. Yeah, we look down on others. We talk negatively about them. We complain about each other. Why? Because we want to get others to be on our side and not theirs. Are we guilty of that? Because we talk negatively about others, even inside the church. Instead of love reigning, sin reigns. Instead of love ruling, sin rules. When everybody has their own plans, it's hard to work together. When we stop listening to others, it's hard to work together. When we think we're always right, it's hard to work together. When these things go on, working together is near impossible. Why? Because it shows the church is fractured, that it is divided. Paul is exhorting us to stand firm in one spirit. It's not our own spirit, but the spirit of God that he is saying, stand firm in. To stand firm together in the spirit of God. And Paul continues with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Have you ever played sports? Have you ever played basketball? Football, volleyball, badminton, table tennis. No, not about table tennis, unless you're playing by yourself. But have you ever played team sports? If you are used to playing basketball, what if the five team members 
on that court said, you know what? Hey, I want the ball. I want the ball. How come you never pass me the ball? How come you don't give me the ball? But sometimes there's one person who loves to get the ball and never passes. I played basketball, and you know who the black hole is. You give it to them, they always dribble, they shoot. They never pass the ball. But if everybody had the mindset to be a point guard, the team will lose. Everybody plays their role. And everybody has a purpose. For me, whenever I went into a team sport, to me it's to win, but at the very end it's to win the championship. That's our goal. And in order to get that championship, we have to work together. And each of us are told what, what positions we're going to be playing, what roles that we're going to be playing. And a lot of times, we have to sacrifice for the betterment of the team. And as a team, we stand firm in that team spirit with one mind striving side by side for the sake of the team and to win that championship. As a team player, there really is no complaining. Even if the other members of the team are playing better than you and you don't play and you're on the bench, you cheer because he or she is helping the team win. And the church can learn a lot from organized team sports. There is no I in church. There is no, one, no, no me in church. The church is not made up of one believer. The church is not a building. Paul writes to the Ephesians, he says, 1, in 1, 22 to 23, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who, fill, who, fill, who fills all in all. Christ is the church. The body of Christ is not one individual. And Paul writes again in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 through 14, 24 through 27, for just as the body is one and as many members and all the members of the body though many are one body so it is with christ for in one spirit we are all baptized into one body jews or greeks slaves or free for and all were made to drink of one spirit for the body does not consist of one member but of many but god has so composed the body giving greater honor to the body to the body part that lacked it that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually, individual the members of it. To work together, to strive side by side, each member of the body must be willing to do whatever part of the body of Christ he created us to be. We are to work together for the common goal and the common good. We are to pray. We are to study God's word. We are to serve each other. We are to share. We are to care. And we are to love. Look around us. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Young and old, we are each other's family members in Christ. In Christ, we are family and in Christ, we are to work together. We are to stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Let us all be encouragers to love each other. Third thing we need in standing firm, we need to stand courageously. And it comes in verses 28 through 30. And not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them that of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Christ did not promise believers 
our lives will be easy. Paul, in these three verses, indicates that Christians living righteously, preaching the gospel, will suffer and they will be persecuted for Christ. So many, when life throws us a curveball, we quickly question if God is there. Paul in 2 Timothy 3.12 tells young Timothy, as he is preparing for many years of ministry ahead, and he tells him, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. When we are persecuted for Christ, it's not unfair. When we are persecuted for Christ, that is what he has called us to do. I remember when I was a young lad of 21 years old, so long ago. I thought how hard, and I was called by God at around 21 years old. I thought to myself, how, how hard can ministry be? I was very naive and very ignorant. To me, to be a pastor was you study God's word, you share God's word, God's is you, God uses you to bring people to him. You share, you, you, you love them. And that's all that I thought, how hard can it be? And I want to share with you, and honestly, I want to share with you, God, that if God had shown me the road ahead, what it's going to be for the next 20 years, 30 years, 40, 50 years, I might have been like Jonah. I would have said, God, I love you. I think you got the wrong number, honestly. I think that's what I might have told him. Because it's hard. Everything you do is hard. And not only that, your family goes through it with you. And it's only you are only called. And that's fine. But when it goes to the family and they're being ridiculed and spoken negatively, then that, to me it's like that's too much. Because they weren't called. I was called. The word frightened, and I would have been frightened I would have been scared. And verse 28 was used of a herd of horses that were afraid and would go into a rage and run violently down the cliff. Paul is saying, don't be like the horses being afraid. Don't be frightened by anything by your opponents. It's an encouragement for us to, to live courageously. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid. Fight the good fight. Finish the race. Don't let the sin so entangle us. Run with perseverance that is marked per, with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Because when we fix our eyes, eyes on Jesus, nothing ever, nothing else really matters because only Christ matters. There are three things to remember when we are suffering persecution. One is this, we have salvation and that salvation is that of God from him. And it's just not any kind of salvation, but salvation that is from God. It's not that I, when I was younger, that I had thick skin. I think once I got into ministry, I became to have thicker skin. Not to let other things around me affect me so much. But just to focus on God and God alone. 
Because why? Because I have salvation. I have security in Christ. Second is a gift and privilege. We have received this gift to believe the salvation, this gift. And we have the privilege to suffer for Christ's sake. One of my favorite quotes is out of John Bunyan, who wrote the famous Pilgrim's Progress. Have you, who's read that book? If you haven't read it, read that book. And it's a spiritual allegory from a prison in Beth, Bedford, England, for preaching the gospel. Do you know what he said? He said, in times of affliction, we common, commonly meet with the sweetest experiences of the love of God. The valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We commonly meet with the sweetest experiences of the love of God. The valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. If that sounds familiar, that's from Psalm 23. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Third thing is we are in good company. Know that we're not alone. Others go through and have gone through the same things. They have gone through it before, they're going through it at the present moment, and they will go through it in the future. And one of my favorite verses, and I'll conclude with this, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, there are people that are cheering us out. There are people that are saying, Go forth. Continue to persevere. Don't let the sin so entangle you. Run with perseverance that is with perseverance the race that is marked out for you. Throw off everything that so entangles us and run and run and run and finish that race. I want us to join together to run this race together to finish this race together. And you know what? It'll be greater than the trophies that the world has to offer. We will be in the presence of God, in the presence of him, and we will be worshiping him. Let us pray.